Good afternoon from Smith School of Business at Queen's University, and thanks for tuning in to this very special webinar, an interview with marketing master Ken Wong. My name is Meredith Dalt, and I'm a business journalist here at Smith School of Business. And our conversation today will be guided by questions that have been pre-submitted by our audience. And they want to know everything from what's ahead for 2022 to what we've learned from the pandemic and everything in between. So we will get to those questions over the course of our conversation. But first, it's my pleasure to introduce today's special guest, the marketing master himself, associate professor and distinguished professor of marketing, Ken Wong. Professor Wong has held both teaching and administrative positions here at Smith, but he's also an alumnus holding both a Bachelor of Commerce and an MBA from Smith School of Business. Ken Wong sits on a number of advisory boards and as a teacher has received numerous awards for his courses in strategic planning, marketing, and business strategy. He is one of the most sought after experts on marketing in Canada and is in Canada's Marketing Hall of Legends, which I think is a fantastic thing to be part of. Thank you for being with us, Ken. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Well, we've got lots of questions for you. I want to start off by situating us where we are right now, which is in sure. the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. How have the last 20 or so months changed the world of marketing? Oh, well, I, I, I don't think you can overstate the impact of the pandemic on business in general and marketing in particular. You know, the, the uh, supply channel shortages certainly have created enormous problems with customer service and the customer experience. Uh, needless to say, pricing is now coming under fire. We're going through a period of inflation. But, you know, I, I think the, the greatest impact of the pandemic is yet to be felt. Because for two years now, or almost two years now, we've been running around putting out forest fires. And, and when that happens, you tend to take your eye off the ball. You lose sight of that long-term vision, that long-term strategy. And so my great fear is that coming out of this pandemic, you know, we may not be able to get back on trajectory as quickly as, as we, we probably would like. So how does that apply to then businesses who are you know, thinking about what they're going to do next year, or next year, next year, when there's so many uncertainties? Well, the biggest problem is that everybody's been dealing with their problems more or less in silos. So procurement was worried about logistics and supply chain management. Marketing wasn't. But marketing has to be because obviously supply chain makes a big impact on what they can make available to their distributors and their consumers. Um, so we've had all of these departments now dealing with problems idiosyncratically, independent of every other department. And the problem is, especially in the world of marketing, your brand is the promise you make to the customer. And so everything that business does has to support that promise. Otherwise, the customer looks at it and says, that's a lie. And I don't form relationships with people that lie to me. Right. So naturally, when you've got all of these departments now dealing with things on their own, maybe they've lost sight of how do marketers think? How do operations people think? How do finance people think? Mm -hmm. and, and that, to me, is the biggest development in brand right now. It's not, it's not digital. Digital is important, of course. But the big, big change is that we're finally coming to realize a brand is a business and a business is a promise we make to a customer. And if you don't make that promise, if you don't keep that promise, you're not going to be around for long, pandemic or not. Right. So has any of this surprised you, what you're seeing then? It surprised me only in, to the extent I never thought we'd be two years into this process. Of course, yeah. I thought we were looking at a three to six month situation and then things would go back to a so-called new normal. Um, we're all waiting for the new normal. Any day now. Oh, I'll tell you the new normal. <laughs> and the new normal is a scary normal. Right. It's a very scary normal. People think that the pandemic was the start of our problems. But if you really think about the global issues that are affecting us right now, the pandemic, even in, 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 the, uh, in the court of public opinion, the pandemic is number two to climate change. Right. Right. Uh, everyone is concerned about what's, what's going on with the weather and, and how that affects our sustainability as far as crops go. Right. You know, there was a recent report that the uh, uh, ability to grow staple crops will be reduced by about 50 percent, while the demand for staple crops will go up 33 percent. Anytime you've got demand exceeding supply like that, you've got the grounds for inflation. Right. Now you add into that all of the cost of EDII, all of the cost of the personal protection equipment and so on. And you can start to see that uh, profit margins for most businesses, certainly not all, there have been some big winners in the pandemic, mm -hmm. uh, but profit margins are getting squeezed. And anytime that happens, you start to worry about the areas we consider semi-discretionary, right. like 
HR. And the purpose of professional development to have a highly qualified workforce. Right. But I can stop funding it temporarily and pick it up later, or so I believe. Same with marketing, same with R&D. Okay. And these are the areas that you really need to have well-developed for your long-term sustained performance. You can get away short-term without them, but over the long-term, you really do require them. And that's my great fear, is that coming out of this pandemic, we're not gonna be able to get back to that long-term long -term vision. Wow, I have a lot in there. Um, some of, most of it sort of like, oh, really? Oh. Can we talk a little bit about how the pandemic has affected consumer behavior? terms of? Sure. Well, we know from number one, uh, if we're talking about the pandemic today, as opposed to the last two years, the last two years have really been, you know, a series of accommodations that we've made to, to take into account the fact that we couldn't sit next to each other, couldn't be in a restaurant or what have you. Coming out, uh, we have a, an unusual set of circumstances. We have Canadians with more savings than ever before, but we also have Canadians with more debt than ever before. And, uh, and we also have Canadians feeling a greater sense of economic uncertainty than ever before. In fact, uh, if you look at the conference board and their survey of consumer confidence, um, we are still not at pre-pandemic levels of consumer confidence. Right. They can, and in fact, the last two months, because I think people are getting frustrated now, they're getting tired, they want this over with. And, and so in the last two, two months, we've seen consumer confidence really take a nosedive, uh, about a third lower than it was pre-pandemic, which means people aren't gonna be in the market to buy big, expensive, uh, durable goods. And uh, you have to remember, consumer expenditure drives about two thirds of our economy, either directly or through derived demand for B2B business. Uh, so when the consumer is, is, watching, is watching their wallet because they're concerned about the economy, naturally it puts the brakes on everything else. Right. So oftentimes what we see is when you go, th go through a period of rapid inflation like we are right now, the result is a recession follows soon after. Right, okay. So have there been any positive consumer behavior changes? We've certainly seen the growth of online shopping. I mean, businesses that didn't think that online shopping was something they had to worry about are suddenly worried about it. Yeah, online shopping certainly took off. Uh, you know, it, it was growing at a rate of 1% uh, per year pre-pandemic. Uh, Post-pandemic, in the first year, it grew 12%, I believe it was. So oh, uh, over a decade's worth of growth in, in one, one certain year. And uh, we're seeing the pains of that now. You know, uh, e-commerce isn't isn't as unblemished as most people make it out to be. You know, we've all had situations with delayed deliveries or hard to make returns or what have you. Uh, but certainly the pandemic drove that engine and the, drove the whole engine towards digitization as well because suddenly we had to have things produced. We had to have them produced quickly because we're now in a state of, of really agile marketing. You know, to be honest, we don't know what's gonna happen over the next year. What we, we have a sense of the range of things that might happen, and so we have a sense of the range of accommodations we may have to make. But if you're looking at your senior management and asking, well, they did this yesterday, why are they doing this uh, today? It doesn't seem to make sense. Well, it didn't make sense given yesterday's conditions, but given today's, it makes a world of sense. And so um, we really have to find new ways, in fact, even for employees to infer or, or imply confidence in their leadership. Because we, we see leaders today requiring characteristics we've never required before. Can you talk a little bit more about that? What do you mean? Sure. Uh, well, obviously, resilience is a big one. Right. Right. I mean, if, if the last two years have taught us anything, it's that uh, things are not always going to go well. Right. And uh, you're going to have to pick yourself up and dust yourself up and, and start all over again. We also see this need for uh, agility, of course, um, because you have to be prepared to be incredibly flexible. And that works very hard in the strategy area because, uh, of course, strategy, you're trying to set things you're not going to have to modify tomorrow. Um, and so it's causing us to think about our strategies in slightly different ways. So, Ken, you just mentioned agile marketing in your response. Can you just talk to the audience a little bit about what you mean by agile marketing? Sure. Um, so, first of all, agile marketing really started in the software industry. Um, and it was necessary there because in software, you're often doing pivots and changes. And, and so you really can't plan the project out in this linear sequential manner 
the way we'd normally think about a business plan. It's kind of, we're gonna take two steps forward, and then we may have to take a step back, then we're gonna take another step forward, and well, we may have to take a step back, half a step back. Now, we're, you know, it, 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 um, you're building uh, a, a willingness and an acceptance of that process that's being built into your timelines and your schedules and so on. And so you're not measuring somebody on the basis of how long did it take you to move from A to C? What you're measuring them on is how good was C when you got there? Did you do all the right things? But I think if you're looking for the biggest change, and I don't know if it's positive or negative, it really depends on one's personal predispositions. Um, materialism is not as important as it used to be. Not for our students looking for careers, not for consumers looking to buy products. Uh, in fact, I was talking with one of our alumni, uh, uh, Laura Henderson from uh, uh, Spin Master Toys, and uh, she was telling me about a survey they did. Uh, parents of my generation, and uh, it's not too old, I hope, but, but parents of my generation, when we wanted the best for our kids, we thought about the best in material terms. I want them to have a great job, a nice house, and, and so on. When you ask millennial mothers, what they want for their children. The answer comes back, happiness, mm -hmm. contentment, peace of mind. There's a, a much greater, I think, focus now on mental health and emotional stability than there was in the past. In the past, it was more about acquiring, acquiring, acquiring. And, and it's an, an endless game, so of course it just fed on itself. Uh, I, I think we're seeing now a generation of people and consumers who are looking for more balance in their life, who are looking to deepen relationships uh, more than just accumulate uh, material gain. Right, so does that mean businesses are having to shift to marketing happiness and peace of mind and joy and love? Absolutely. Instead of stuff? Absolutely. That's quite a different task. <laughs> uh, well, yes and no. You, you know, uh, the thing most people forget is that when you start a marketing campaign, you don't start with your product. You start with the problem the customer has, and then you ask yourself, what are all the dimensions of that, of that problem? And some of those dimensions I can take care of with the product. So for example, um, assume that I'm a balding male, right? Now I can get Rogaine and, and other things that I can put them in my hair and it'll thicken it up and, and so on. So the product works. But can the product by itself get me over my reluctance to go into a drugstore and say, for all intents and purposes, I'm balding, I need this product. That's a different situation altogether. You're not going to attack that problem uh, you know, with, with your product. It's going to be your advertising. It'll be something you do at the point of distribution. And so you really have to put yourself in that customer's perspective and say, what's the problem they're facing? What are all the elements? And then what are the tools available to me to, to sort of tick off, knock off those elements uh, one at a time or, or in, in some, some sequence? And so in that sense, if you think that emotion has always had uh, some, some part to play in our decisions, uh, sometimes major, sometimes minor, but always some part to play. It just, so it's just a shifting priority for us. Right, okay, maybe we can convince that guy that a bald head is an attractive thing and we wouldn't need any product at all. Well, that's, that's, <laughs> that's the way to go, isn't it? <laughs> so I would love it if you could give us a moment um, to have you reflect on, the, I mean, you've seen a lot of change in the world of marketing in the last 40 years. Um, probably we could spend all day just talking about that alone. But if you were to kind of sum up, like in general, how you've seen consumer habits change, can you do that in a short? <laughs> Short, short answer. How I've seen consumer habits change? And over the course of your career, you've seen massive amounts of change. You've said as much. Um, I think cons consumer expectations are higher now than they ever were okay. before. Um, at the same time, I think trust in business is lower than it was when I started this, uh, this out. Why do you uh, think that is? Oh, I, I think consumers have been deceived. I, I, I think... Uh, sometimes uh, intentionally, but more often than not unintentionally. Um, you know, we are, we're always driven, uh, our satisfaction as consumers is always driven against our expectations, right? It's not whether the product performed, it's whether it performed up to our expectations. So for example, um, you ever go to a movie and, and everybody says, this is the greatest movie in the world, it's a blockbuster hit, you, you, you know, you can't miss it. And you go to the movie and you walk out and, and your partner says, so what did you think? And you go, well, I don't know. I mean, it was a good movie, but you know, it 
wasn't great, you know. <laughs> I mean, maybe I shouldn't have read the book first. You know, when I read the book, it created this expectation. I thought they'd do this, they didn't do it. So I'm like, eh, it was a good movie, but not, not outstanding. And then it wins 12 Academy Awards, and you're <laughs> sitting there going, well, I, you know, I guess I was a little harsh on them. Um, but I think nowadays, because of science and because of technology, we expect everything to be possible. And, and so we're not actually uh, that fair in our evaluations. So, for example, during COVID, uh, an interesting discovery, uh, obviously, uh, uh, e-commerce picked up with seniors in a big way. And everyone predicted that, you know, the seniors would find it uh, burdensome, uh, foreign, that they wouldn't like it. The seniors were amazed. They all said, this is great. I can order it any time of day. It arrives within a couple of days, if not tomorrow. This, this is fabulous. The people who were disappointed were the millennials. Because they're sitting there going, well, it's good, but you know, given this technology, they could also be doing that. They could be doing this. It, it reminded me when, uh, when my sons were living at home and uh, uh, I was doing some work for Microsoft and I brought home a, 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 a pre-release version of, of an Xbox. And I thought, oh, this is going to be great. I'm going to be the hero for my kids. You know, all the neighborhood kids, I'll be the cool dad. This will be fabulous, <laughs> right? And so I'm sitting there and they're playing this game and I'm going, wow, isn't it great that it does this? Isn't it great that it does that? And the kids are uninspired and they're sitting there going, well, yeah, of course it can do that. But why can't I turn and talk to the fellow on my right? Why can't I do this? Why? They live in a very different world than we do. And, you know, my fear is we sometimes think of it as entitlement. It's not entitlement. It's just higher expectations than we have. There is some entitlement, mind you. <laughs> but by and large, it's more a question of higher expectations of business and technology than we've ever had before. That's a tough bar for businesses. Oh. If you've got all these people with all these expectations and you're just doing your best to stay alive, like, that's tough. Yeah, well, I, I'll tell you, I, I, am, uh, I am 68 years old. And so sometime soon I'll be retiring. Yes, yeah, so, uh, you, so you threaten, but I don't know. Yeah, I've been threatening for a while. But, <laughs> yeah. but anyways, uh, sometime soon I'll be retiring. And, and if I reflect uh, on my career, I have to say, boy, this is a good time to get out. <laughs> we're going to face a host of problems we just have never seen before. Uh, and, and maybe you could call them challenges or interesting well, they're challenges, I mean, <laughs> and somebody will will crack the code. Make right. no mistake, uh, and, and hopefully it'll be a Queens alumni, and we'll all be celebrating uh, in a building named after them. Is it worth me asking <laughs> you? I mean, dare I ask you when you say problems in that sweeping way? Do we want to dig in? Oh, sure, sure. I mean, a host of problems sounds really daunting. Well, I, I call them problems only in the sense that they're problems for me because I'd have to change. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, I, I'd like to be able to, 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 uh, to live off my existing assets. Unfortunately, at this point in time, if I'm going to spend tomorrow in the classroom, I have, to ex I have to expand my repertoire. I have to know something about digital marketing. Right. Social media, obviously. Influencers, obviously. I mean, all of these are relatively new developments. And I can't let them slide. I, I have to stay abreast of them. And at the same time that I'm trying to stay abreast of these new marketing tools, there's a whole new changeover in, in management going on. You know, you look at the relationship between labor and management, it's not what it was five years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, suddenly we have a shortage of jobs, shortage of skilled labor. All of a sudden people are making demands, uh, receiving multiple job offers. Um, it, it's funny, I was telling my, my uh, class of undergraduate seniors uh, a couple of weeks ago that um, oddly enough, uh, I have a lot in common with them because I came into the, into the world of working at a time when the economy was booming and there were lots of job offers and everybody had a choice. Uh, I came into the world when inflation was operating in the double digits. People were renewing mortgages at 19%. Crazy, huh? So yeah. here we are 40 years later yeah. and, and I find myself with a certain sense of deja vu. Huh, okay. Um, great. <laughs> I don't know if we should feel optimistic, but what should we be feeling? Oh, optimistic. You know something? It, it, if I've learned one thing in 40 years, it is that we are a resilient species. We are. Uh, and, and we are highly inventive and highly creative, and somebody will crack the code, right. and somebody will make a billion dollars because of it, and good right. for them. Might as well be someone we know. That's the system, yeah. right? <laughs>
So I want to ask you some general marketing questions just before we get to our audience questions. Um, if, if I could ask you this question, what are the greatest misconceptions around marketing in your mind? Single biggest one? Yeah. Marketing is advertising. Oh, yeah? Dig in, please. Sure. Um, when I teach introductory marketing, or when I used to teach introductory marketing, advertising was always the last topic I taught. And that was for two reasons. Number one, I know nothing about advertising. Right. Here I am, the so-called legend. I've never done an ad in my life. I've never written copy in my life. Evaluated thousands, but never actually written one. Advertising is a creative game. And as I often say to people, look how I'm dressed. This is not the uniform of creativity. A red tie, <laughs> white shirt, gray, gray suit. You know, that's not highly creative. Um, but, but advertising is the most visible thing that marketers do. And so when people ask me questions like, what's a great marketing campaign? What they're really asking me for is, what was the last great ad campaign you saw that you liked? Yeah. As opposed to when we think about a, a, a really an integrated marketing program, we're thinking about the right product in the right place with the right price and the right promotion. Um, and so it really is a more general management function. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, certainly one of the changes I've seen in students uh, in the 40 years, when I arrived here in the early 80s, brand management was, that was the pinnacle. That's what everybody wanted, was to be a brand manager at Procter & Gamble or Unilever or what have you. Um, that's now been replaced by investment banking and consulting. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, you know, follow the money, so to speak. <laughs> right? and, and, and when that happened, uh, while that was happening, a lot of the so-called four P's of marketing were getting siphoned off into specialty functions within the business. Four P's, please, for those who may not be product, familiar. Product, place, or distribution. Mm -hmm. Promotion, which is obviously your marketing communication, and pricing. Right. And now we have companies that have a separate pricing group. All they do is run pricing models. We have, uh, obviously, a Marcom group. Um, we also have a group that deal with distributors and e-commerce. And so the lines between these functional areas is getting very blurred. And that's why I think you're seeing this return back now to your marketing manager as, um, uh, call it your central coordination. I won't call them a manager because they're not really managing, but they are coordinating that overall effort and, and trying to get to everyone to, to do what the plan requires them to do in order for the plan to be successful. And, and this has always been a great challenge in marketing because we really violate the most fundamental rule of management. You know, the fundamental rule of management is that responsibility and authority should go hand in hand. Well, marketers have bottom line responsibility for the performance of their brand. However, they don't have the legal authority to get anybody to do anything. Right. I can't walk into operations and say, I realize you've got back orders all over the place, but give priority to mine. You know, um, we, we just don't have that capability. And so your marketing manager today, you know, in addition to the resilience and the agility and all of that, they also have to have an incredible level of EQ, the ability to put themselves in the other person's shoes and, and really see the world through their eyes and ask the questions that you know are gonna run through their heads. So, you know, if somebody comes to me and says, you need to modify your schedule to accommodate me, what am I thinking about? All the things I have to do in order to make that modification possible. Mm -hmm. And if I don't want to do them or I can't do them, it doesn't matter what your strategy is, I'm not doing there for you. Right. And, and so we're seeing people are paying a lot more attention to being liked at work right. and a lot more attention to being liked, I think, in general, because right. they've now found that it is the most effective way to, to secure that kind of, uh, of loyalty from your staff. So do you see that as a mistake that brands are making? No, not Thinking at all. About it? No, okay. No, um, a brand is supposed to be an, an, an integrated effort. It brings the, the parts of a lot of people together um, to produce the, this single campaign. And, and you, to do that, you have to be a leader. You cannot just be a manager or an analyst or pencil pusher. Okay. You've got to understand people. You got to understand what motivates them, what causes them to get up in the morning. You have to be able to look at them and know, you know, today, how are they feeling? What are they going through? How can I help them? Um, you know, uh, leaders don't actually do the work. 
leaders mobilize other people to do the work. They just make sure the right work is getting done. And, and so in that sense, uh, I think if anything, uh, the pandemic has made us much more aware that these words like leadership and resilience and agility, these aren't just soft buzzwords that we're throwing around the classroom. These are essential concepts to, to survive and thrive uh, in our new environment. Got it. Thank you. Um, you did mention people are always asking you to list off your favorite campaigns. I do want to ask you that. <laughs> so. Is it, are there any, any campaigns that you can point to that have either really, like let's say that in the last couple of years, in the pandemic era, are there, are there any that you can point to of recent mind that are like was really fantastic and nailed it, or on the other side that maybe missed the mark? Uh, in the last couple of years. Well, wow. in the pandemic. Sure. You know, like, uh, like Tim Hortons, for example, has a new campaign. I believe they're making Bieber Timbits or something. Mm -hmm. um, now, so, they're also at the same time promoting all these espresso beverages. Now, when one goes to Tim Hortons, one doesn't always think about an espresso beverage or, you know, just a Bieber. <laughs> are they, how are they doing? Is that the right approach? Okay. So, um, the thing that always gives me trouble when someone asks me to comment on a campaign there are two things. The first is separating my sense of aesthetic from the customer's sense of aesthetic, right? I don't have to like an ad. Um, my customer has to like my ad, but I don't. And, and that's an important thing for all managers to, all marketing managers that's to realize. That's a tough realize. thing though. Don't you want to like your ad? Only if I'm, the, if I'm part of the target segment. Got it, okay. Right, but if I'm advertising, and let's use a very extreme example, if I'm using a, a, um, a selling a feminine hygiene product to women, <laughs> yes, I am not, You're not, the I am user. not in that market. I, I, and and uh, my wife will be the first to tell you, I would be the last to profess that I know how women think. <laughs> so, you know, good, good hey, luck with that. at least you know, right? Good luck with that, right? <laughs> yes. So it, it, it's, that's always a challenge for me. And the second thing is, I don't always know the whole context of what's being done. So for example, in the last two years, the best campaign I've seen is not a campaign at all. It's a collection of moves that was done by London Drugs, the uh, drugstore chain on the West Coast. And, and London Drugs is uh, at, at present the most trusted brand in British Columbia. Now that, that, that's a, a big, claim to be able to make for a regional player against national giants, international giants, to say they're the most trusted brand. And to have that trust in an area of healthcare at a time like this oh, yeah. is invaluable. So what's London Drugs done to, to deserve it? Well, number one, they took a couple of aisles and dedicated it to local suppliers. People whose products they didn't normally carry, but realizing that these people had no other, well, nowhere to go and it takes a community to raise an economy. So they did that. They had specials on masks and things of that nature. Um, most recently with the, uh, the flooding in British Columbia and the huge challenges that's created, uh, they've actually used planes to fly product into their stores. They are showing day to day, minute to minute, that they are prepared to live up to their commitment to their community. And to me, that's just, that, that is just a, an outstanding stance to take, number one, aesthetically. Mm -hmm. But number two, the fact that they are putting actions behind their words. This isn't a greenwashing. This isn't somebody standing up and saying, oh, well, you know, now that we're in a pandemic, we really do care about your health and safety. Right. Well, if you cared about it, you'd care about it 10 years ago as well. And so for London Drugs to do this sort of thing over and over again is just uh, um, is worthy of admiration. Um, I see other ads though. Uh, um, Stephen Graham, um, a commerce grad of ours, by the way, um, is now the COO of a company called Quest Trade. And Quest Trade, uh, you may remember some of the ads of, uh, uh, it's not a game, it's my family's future. Uh, you're not just using mom and dad's guy, are you? Um, these were moments of insight that, that just blew me away. Um, because I, I've, I've heard the comment made before by people. I, I know that people feel this way. And so for them to be able to capture that in 15 seconds is, is to me astounding, absolutely astounding. Hmm. Great examples, thank you. 
So Ken, I want to um, take this moment now to shift over to some of our audience questions. We've got a slew of things. Um, our first one is a great question about uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion in the marketing space. It actually comes from Glynis, who describes herself as one of your MBA students in the 1990s. And Glynis asks, what are your thoughts on the role of marketing in social issues like diversity, equity, and inclusion? Well, you know, there, there are two obvious roles we play. One is how we depict the world around us in our advertisements and so on. And, and certainly we've seen tremendous change there. The more important way, I think, though, is that marketers and the world, um, we're finally starting to pay more attention and become more sensitive to some of the changes or, or differences that exist in people not because they're black or white, but because of how they were raised or, or the milieu in which they were raised or the economic conditions in which they were raised. So do you think that it took, I mean, what, I think what maybe some people are responding to is that we've seen these big social movements in the U.S., the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, what we seem to see are brands kind of going, whoa, 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 we better respond to these things, when in fact none of these issues are new. It's just that they seem to be at the forefront of our minds all of a sudden. And so are brands reacting? To that? Well, I think COVID was certainly a tipping point for a lot of these social justice issues. But as you say, quite correctly, they were all here for a long time. I think the difference now is that the public is starting to say, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. I'm fed up with this. You guys should know better. You're taking my money. I expect you to treat me in a certain way. And if you're not, then that's fine. I'll buy e-commerce. I'll buy on price and you'll all be out of work. And do you think this is a, a blip, a moment, or do you think this is a real shift in, in, the, in the landscape? No, I this think is this, is, stick? this is making explicit a shift that was already taking place. You know, if, if all you want is the product in its stripped down version, uh, bare bones, then you buy on price. If you want something more, if you want that content, uh, that user assistance, if you want that social responsibility, there's a price for it. There's a cost that the companies have to assume, and we have to pay it. And people seem to be willing to pay it these days. Right. They weren't in the past. And, and the very fact that brands are so powerful, right? Brands shape our world now. Do you think that they have a role to play in actually making positive change? You know, uh, there was a time when I think people defined themselves by the brands they bought. And so we wore them very proudly. Um, Coming out of that period, we, we fell into another period where we measured our, our self-worth by what kind of a deal did I get. So it wasn't that uh, I bought a Lexus car. It's that I bought a Lexus car, bought it on eBay, incredible price, just $6. Yeah, it was $6,000 <laughs> shipping cost, but it was just 6 bucks for the car. Um, your ability to get a great deal, be a treasure hunter, that was a big part of what was moving people. Now, I think a big part of what's moving people is this desire for togetherness and, 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 and relationships and happiness. Um, I've never seen it this strong. And this is coming from somebody who grew up in the 60s, right? I mean, it was all love and peace and so on. But I, I, I think the current, uh, the current environment seems to be more focused on relationships and people uh, than material things. And that's why I think climate change and sustainability are becoming dominant issues. Um, a lot of people my age are starting to think now, geez, what damage did we do to this product, to this uh, planet? You know, what shape have I left this in for my kids and grandkids and so on? And, and all of that is ratcheting up our social consciousness. So, you know, things like EDI, um, that's not an option anymore. You know, that's not something you're doing because you're trying to get ahead of the game. You're doing it because you have to do it, because it's a basic requirement uh, uh, of being in business. Great examples, thank you. We have a really excellent question about putting purpose ahead of profit in the marketing space. So Katrina asks, hi Ken, in your opinion, can you articulate the difference between purpose marketing and being a purpose-driven business? It seems the former may be brand positioning and the latter is a full business transformation to be driven by purpose ahead of profit. Thanks. Well, she's actually answered her own question. <laughs> yeah, but, but that, that, that is the fundamental difference. Right. Um, you know, is, is that, and we, we, we're going to see some of this now with climate change, right? We're going to see a lot of greenwashing. Companies that never mentioned the environment before and companies for whom a connection to the environment is third or fourth or fifth order consequence. It, it's distant, but they're going to want to be seen to be doing the right thing. And so they're all going to be jumping on the bandwagon. That's the positioning Marcom issue. 
Um, purpose, a, a purpose brand, however, um, it's really not about the financials. I mean, obviously, they have to be fiscally responsible. They have to, to stay in existence. Um, but they're prepared to do whatever it takes to make certain that the brand message uh, gets conveyed. OK. Thank you for the question to Katrina. We're going to move to a question from Clemencia, who asks, again, a question about pandemic recovery. So she asks, what is the best way to differentiate a B2B brand in a post-pandemic world? <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. And if I could, <laughs> yeah, well, let, me, let me start by saying if I could answer that question uh, in a universal way, I, I wouldn't be here today. With all due respect to you and Smith, uh, I'd be... Uh, Running uh, the world? I'd be running the world along with Elon Musk. Yes. Another Queens grad, by the way. Oh, uh, no, he didn't graduate. We oh, all... that's right. He just yeah, came. But he did come. That's right. Significant that the richest man in the world wasn't smart enough to graduate, but that's, that's oh, another story. Oh, complicated. Okay. <laughs> anyway. Uh, Post-pandemic world. All right. So um, what is the biggest problem facing businesses that produce for other businesses today? Supply chain. Right. Supply chain guarantees reliability, um, old time virtues. It's going to come back to that. Uh, who can I count on? And, and you know, we're even seeing this in the world of retailing now. Uh, retailers and distributors used to live in this adversarial world. You know, there was only so much margin available, and I wanted the lion's share, and so on. What we're discovering now is that if if manufacturers and retailers are working together they can produce a source of differentiation that neither could produce on their own. That through this cooperation, they can add value, protect their prices, protect their margins, and so on. And so we are seeing this, this, this big change now in relationships uh, within the B2B space. I, I want to be your friend. I want to be your buddy. And, and part of it is just plain common sense. You're going to have a shortage of supply. You're going to have a million people asking you for back orders. Wouldn't you like to give some to your friend? Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> I, I'm your buddy. What are you suggesting? Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I, I, was, I was there for you, you know, when you needed a special uh, to make your quota three months ago. Uh, I, I found the special for you, didn't I? Right. Well, you know, I, I need a little something from you here and... One hand rubs the uh, one one uh, one uh, person rubs the other's back, and yeah. everybody's happy. So, sort of harkening back to what you were saying before about all of us living in a, I don't know, going into the world in a more helpful, open, wanting to be yeah, friendly, well, liked. Well, think about yourself as a customer. You know, what do you want? It's it's basics. You right. know, I want trust. I want to know that if the product doesn't work, you're going to take it back. Mm -hmm. I want to know that if you promise it to me on Thursday, it'll be here on Thursday. Or there'll be at least an explanation of why it'll be there Friday instead of Thursday. Uh, I want reliability on prices and costs. And, you know, I just, I need to depend on people. I got so much on my plate right now. You know, and I can't put more on until I take some off. And I can't take some off because I'm too busy with all the other stuff going on. So please, if somebody can come and do some of this for me, I'm going to be a very, very happy camper. <laughs> uh, I think if ever there was a, a, a time to, to move aggressively to form relationships with your B2B customers, this is it. Okay, good. That's a good tip. I'm going to get to some more specific questions. We had a slew of quite specific questions, but I'm going to just throw them at you and sure. see how you do. Um, so this is uh, some specific industry stuff, keeping the environment top of mind. Vinay writes, how can oil and gas companies address the branding challenges that they face with the current energy transition wave across the globe to ensure they secure the best talent and continue to see sustained growth? Okay. Uh so let me start with my assumption that if you want sustained growth, you need great talent. And if you want great talent, whether you're in oil or gas or anywhere else, it means that you have to understand what people want from their careers. And not everybody wants the same thing from their careers. You know, there are some people who live to eat and there are some people who eat to live. And the same is true with work. All right? There are some for whom our job is everything and some for whom it's it's a way to put food on the table, nothing more, nothing less, and everything in between. And so if you're thinking about it in those terms and you're saying, well, how does oil and gas do it? Well, how does a grocery store do it? How does anybody do it? You first identify who that customer is you want. If it's oil and gas, I'm going to assume they're looking for engineers. 
And then you ask the question, what does an engineer want from their career? Is it money? Is it speed of advancement? Is it uh, a breadth of experiences? There are a lot of ways that you can slice and dice your career options. And, and so you have to have the discipline to force yourself to itemize what are those things they want. Because it's not about the future of oil and gas or, or oil and gas versus electric, you know, non-fossil fuels. It, it's not about that at all. It is about whether or not you actually have something to sell, in this case, a career. And if you have something to sell and it's a career, then it has to touch the right buttons uh, on that prospective employee's uh, list. Uh, otherwise, they're, they're not going to want to work for you. It, and it, again, it doesn't matter what the industry is. Do you the think it doesn't matter? The process is the same. Because you did, sustainability is top of mind for so many people. Do you think that oil and gas and those fossil fuel burning industries are going to have more of a problem marketing themselves in the world in general, although we're still so reliant on them? Well, again, I, I think that the climate change issue raises the, the, the awareness that people have of the, of the issue. Um, does that result in more people wanting to go into the industry? I don't think so. Not unless you saw somebody as having this messiah complex where they think they can save oil and gas by, by choosing to go there. I think in the end, we still end up choosing our careers based upon what we think is, is in it for us. So I might look at oil and gas right now and I might say to myself, well, given climate change and sustainability, that industry is not going to grow, so probably I can't meet my career prospects there. If that's the situation and you're in oil and gas and you're trying to recruit that employee, the real question becomes, what can you do to protect the longevity of their career? What can you do to show them that there is a, um, you know, a career plan that they can embark upon? Uh, what exemplars can you show them that prove that it's possible? Okay. You're advertising. It's no different than selling a product. And so you have to come back to the consumer motivations. And, and you know, this is the thing we forget. We're, it's so caught up with analytics and everything else. And make no mistake, I am a huge, huge, huge fan of analytics. I started out as a stats prof, in fact. Okay. So I, I am really in, into the numbers. But again, the numbers can't reflect human nature. I need that insight. I need, I need observation. Um, I, I need EQ. A and the, the greatest marketing school you can go to is right outside the door. Just open your eyes and watch people shop. Watch their reactions. Listen to them when they're watching an ad or, or TV program. That's where you really learn how people are thinking. You know? and, and, um, Comedians are often great marketers for that reason. It's the power of observation, right? right? It's not that they're rip-roaring funny, but, oh, geez, yeah, I do that. Oh, yeah, my friends do that. Yeah, our family does that. Yeah, I never thought of it. Yeah, we're a little stupid for doing it that way, but, yeah, that's what we do. Um, <laughs> human nature is, is incredibly humorous when you, when you think about it. And, and so, you know, for all of these students right now, that really becomes the essence, is just observe what's going on. Right. Great advice. Um, I've got a question pertaining to the automotive sector. We'll try to just sure. buzz through some of these. So Chris asks, with the convergence of the automotive and the high-tech sectors to produce battery electric vehicles and ultimately autonomous vehicles, how important will marketing become to consumers and investors as the automotive sector approaches with superior operational effectiveness and the high-tech side is led by brilliant quasi-celebrities, I believe you named one earlier, selling a dream of the future? Well, if marketing is advertising, I don't know that we have a huge role to play, to be honest with you, uh, because I think the media will, will, will create all the awareness we need. Right. Why pay for something that you can get for free? <laughs> of right? course. Um, however, uh, not all electric vehicles will be created equal. They'll differ in their range. They'll differ in their noise. They'll differ in their level of creature comforts. They'll differ in the size of the screen that they pump all this information to you on. Um, there will still be differences between vehicles, right. and marketing's job is to point out those differences. Do you think those quasi, as he called them, a quasi, I forget what, what Dave called them, Chris, uh, quasi-celebrities selling their dream of the future, how important are those figures in the brand stories? Well, with, with any innovation, you have to realize not everybody is equally open to taking a chance on a new technology or a new product. And, and so... Um, you know, if you believe the stats, there's probably about 15% of the market who will buy into anything that is new and proposed as revolutionary. Um, 
And they are largely buying on what we call a conceptual basis. Um, I'm buying a dream of the future. Right? Once we get beyond that 15% uh, of the population, now we're into a more pragmatic buyer. They don't really care about the vision. What they care about is they need a vehicle, mm -hmm. and so they want, they want to know is, when will I get it? What will it cost? What features will it have? We're back to the old school. But if they're choosing an electric vehicle over a combustion engine vehicle, and, and we are, and we, as you've mentioned multiple times, like we've got, we've got the, the climate change at the top of our conscious minds right now, they're not just, are they making those decisions just based on that, when can I get it, when, you know? Are they not making a decision to buy something that is different and maybe less polluting and maybe less impactful on the environment? Well, there are two decisions being made. The first is, do I go electric or do I go conventional? Right. And then the second is, once I go electric, which electric? Right. So marketing will obviously have a huge role in the which electric. But what about that you should go electric? There, it really depends. I, I, don't, I don't believe it's marketing as much as it is overall media. Oh, interesting. Uh, okay. I, I think the overall media will create the sense of whether or not uh, this concern is, is, is uh, justified or not. Um, I think the consumer will also vote with their wallet. Um, but that's the other thing. You know, for a long time, consumers were captive to, to one or two firms. And so we basically bought whatever they sold. Um, nowadays, I think we're much more prepared to walk or wait. And we have more options. The internet has opened up a world of options to us. Mm -hmm. And so if I don't like what you're doing, I'm not buying it. Uh, speaking of the future, mm -hmm. <laughs> Ryan is asking a question with a little future forecasting. Hi, Professor. I run a digital agency, and we're trying to see around the corner, he's written with quotes, to understand what the digital ad space will be like once cookies go away and how this may change channel mix, ad spends, and how brands will pivot in a cookie-less world interested in your thoughts on this. I don't suppose he means cookies that we eat with No, coffee. he means cookies yeah. that, 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 that track you, basically. Yes. Right. <laughs> Are we heading to a cookie-less world? You uh, like ad, you said you like numbers? I, I like numbers, <laughs> I do like numbers. Um, I, I think we are heading towards a cookie-less world. More importantly, I think we're headed to a, to a world where consumers are finally starting to wake up and smell the coffee when it comes to privacy uh -huh. um, and, and consumer protection. And, um, you know, it, it, it's okay if you're buying a $5 item on, on some e-commerce site and it's faulty and you go, uh, you know, why, why bother pursuing a refund? It's just $5. We'll, we'll let it go. When they start playing with identity theft, uh, when you start needing a half hour more to go through your email every day to sift out the junk, um, when your uh, senior mother or father calls you and they tell you that they've just won uh, a vacation for, for 12 to uh, some uh, destination. <laughs> oh yes. you know, when it gets to that point, now it's hitting home. And, and now I think you're going to see people making hard decisions about whether or not to, to go with a particular supplier based upon whether or not they can protect your privacy. Are there examples out there of, of that shift happening now? Well, the examples, of course, uh, uh, you look at, at a company like uh, Equifax, the credit Bureau. Mm -hmm. uh, they had a hack uh, two years ago. Um, I think it was five or six thousand files. Not a huge number, but but a significant number. Their share price went from I think 130 U.S. down to 80 almost overnight. Now they've they've uh, remedied the problem and so on. Share prices back up around 140 or something of that ilk. Um, uh, by the way, I, I, I do want to draw um, your attention to the fact that I am a marketer, <laughs> but I'm talking about share prices and finance because yeah, yeah. it's all business. Right. Right. And, uh, you know, marketing's job isn't to turn out ads that people like. It's, it's turn out ads that sell product. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, in that regard, when I think about, uh, uh, about Equifax, if they hadn't taken the strong stance that they had on privacy right from the get-go, the moment it broke, it was, we know why it happened, we've put a control on it, and we've put in place procedures to make sure it'll never happen again. And if more companies did that, they'd be like Maple Leaf. It was the same thing. We've identified the problem, we've solved the problem, 
We're doing this to make sure it doesn't happen again. Just for context, that was a bacteria in the that was a bacteria, right, or a E. coli or something, right? Wasn't it? That was a right. bacteria E. coli. But that was yeah. I remember the CEO was very transparent about what was happening and what they were doing to rectify it. And loss of privacy is the same thing, right? And if you look at the backlash that Meta slash Facebook is facing right now because of the whistleblower, mm -hmm. right? It, it wasn't that long ago that uh, a major Canadian retailer, Lush. Uh, decided that they were going to cancel all social media because they didn't feel that the social media companies were protecting their customers in a way that Lush wants their customers it's protected. such a bold move because I would imagine that, that Lush's target audience live online in the world of social. Well, they do, but at the same time, not everybody uses social in the same way. Right. So, Ken, we're almost at the end of our hour. I wanted to... Um, You've touched on so many things, and and right from the start, there's a like there's a bit of heaviness about a lot of our discussion with like it's a really changing time. There's a lot going on. The climate, you know, there's lots we don't know about what's coming next. I do want to, as we head and we look towards 2022, I do want to kind of leave the audience with a sense of of hope, maybe of of a spirited moving with you know a big smile out in, into the future. Um, do you? Like, what are you looking for? What do you want to give our audience in, in that sort of positive move into the into the future? Okay, a couple of things. Yeah. Uh, so first of all, let me ask you a question. Uh oh. Um, you're a journalist. Good with Can words. Be, sometimes. Good with words. Yeah. Right. Do crossword puzzles? No. No. Sorry. Oh, okay. Sorry. So need another example, yeah. I guess. <laughs> but you can use it anyway. Just well, to... assume you did crossword <laughs> puzzles. Okay. Would you do easy, medium, or hard? Oh gosh, probably medium. Why? Because I don't do crossword puzzles, so you're asking no, okay. me. To, <laughs> okay. I don't know. Most Throw people, in. Well, the, most people won't do easy because it's too easy. Too easy. Right? They want the medium or hard. They want the challenge. They want the sense that they've accomplished something. Right. And certainly in this environment, you have lots of opportunity to accomplish things. Right. The thing that makes it different today, and, and, and to me, this has always been a requirement for success. You can't go off what we teach you in business school. You have to have a personal sense of how it all fits together, a personal sense of what's important to know about consumers and competitors and so on. You know, it, 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 it's, not, it's not a field where you can just take a SWOT analysis and stick it up and say, oh, there's the solution to our problem. You know, I've never seen a SWOT analysis, in fact, in a corporate presentation, right? <laughs> I've seen people use it to think about the problem, but never in the presentation. Um, and so I would really encourage people that you have to come to this business school and on day one, you open up a fresh notebook and you start to record your impressions and your observations and your opinions. You start to form this personal sense of what sells and what doesn't sell, what causes costs to go up and what doesn't. Uh, you start to think about you know, how to motivate people. You know, what, uh, do people work best under stress or when things are loose and easy? These are all individual choices that you're going to make as a, as a manager and an executive. And the totality of those choices will dictate whether or not you are successful or not. So when I look at the, the, some of the brilliant marketers that have come out of this place, they're not brilliant because they know how to write good ads or, or know how to set prices. They're brilliant because they have this insight into human nature. And they have this insight into their employees and their customers, and they're able to look at, at this body of theory in the context of, yes, I see what should work on average. Now, is my situation average, or is there some accommodation I have to make to that model that they've given me to make it right for my case? And the great ones have that capacity to adapt. Amazing. Now, I want you to take that and tell me a, co a couple of concrete things then for, for 2022. So, yeah, you've got going in with that spirit. We're looking for some sense of what, what can we expect to see in terms of marketing 2022. We'll see if you're right. We'll, okay. check, in in a <laughs> we'll, well check in next year and be like, so, he so, got it. So are you, asking me it. What, are you asking me what they should do or what I think they will do? What do you think we're going <laughs> to see from marketing in 2022? I mean, you already talked about how much vast change is happening You've talked about um, how much things have changed in the time that you've been at the world of marketing and how you're having to learn all these new things to teach your students because you didn't have to deal with them uh, earlier I, in your I career. So what goes, what happens next? Well, this is me pointing into the future. Okay, again. so a variety of things. So first of all, I, I think overall you're going to see more content being stressed. Um, 
because for us to appreciate the qualities of a product or the value-added services that come with it, we need that overall story and that sense that this is the right product for us. Um, so what we do with content will, will obviously be a key part of our offering. There's no question that you have to look at uh, inflation and the cost pressures companies are going to be facing. And so there'll be tremendous opportunities in things like artificial intelligence, machine-based learning, um, automated email, um, anything that, that takes humans out of the equation for the purpose of execution, not strategy and creation, right. but for the purpose of execution, I think you can expect to see. No different than driverless cars, you know, or driverless trucks, what have you. Um, so you're, you're certainly gonna continue to see that. And I think you're going to see uh, pressure on businesses in general to do even more with even less. And that's really gonna accelerate this move towards technology because that becomes the one great salvation is, uh, yeah, it is how we use technology in our overall processes. So a lot more Six Sigma type work, um, uh, you know, strategic quality initiatives and so on. But you may see those frameworks now being applied in the marketing arena. So lean manufacturing is now going to be lean marketing as well. Don't do anything more than you absolutely have to because there's, there's no payback for it. So that would be the, the second thing. And the third thing I think you're going to see is more entrepreneurial action. And the, the reason for that is, number one, I think our students are arriving um, with an entrepreneurial option in mind. Yeah, they want to go work for somebody, but really they want to run their own business. Um, and, and that has been an influence that has grown steadily since I started here. But it really is at a peak right now because now you've got people like... Um, Michelle Romanov, uh, you know, uh, another Queens grad, uh, running ClearBank, uh, providing not only access to financing, but advice for startup businesses. So there's never been more opportunity. And the pandemic has just revealed so many needs that we have, and people are naturally going to come up with ways of, 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 uh, of satisfying those needs. By contrast, five years ago, I'd have 10 students come to my office and say, I want to start a business. And I'd say, let me guess, you've got an app in mind. Everybody had an app, right? <laughs> hey, now apps are big business once yeah. upon a time. Well, now, now there's apps and a whole lot more. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's great advice. I fear we are, in fact, out of time. Imagine. No. We've just been talking for an hour. Um, this is where I get to do my little spiel to our audience, which is to tell them that that was our last webinar of 2021. But we are going to be back in 2022 uh, with lots more interesting content. And uh, in the meantime, if they're desperate to be reading about all the great stuff that we do here at Smith, um, Smith Business Insight is a great resource. Lots of articles there about everything from marketing to entrepreneurship to organizational behavior to everything in between, finance. Um, so visit smithqueens.com slash insight to read up on all that kind of stuff there. Ken, it was just such a delight to get to talk to you today. Well, thank you. Um, we're really lucky here at Smith to have someone with your kind of lived and earned experience 40 years 40 plus years in the marketing yeah. world older not old uh, <laughs> but but um, if I could add one thing you know um, Smith and Queens has been very good to me um, but the way in which it's been very good to me is it's always surrounded me by outstanding colleagues and and I I know everybody says that it's a team game blah 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 and nobody really believes it but but I do um, you know, we have a, an amazing array of people here, and we are all dedicated to our student success. Uh, we, you know, some of us may be more research or teaching oriented or what have you. You know, we have our differences. Of course we do. But our, our overall goal, you know, the career success of our students, that, that's, that's a priority for all of us. And so if I can remind your audience of one thing, it is that they have an infinite level of after-sales service. When you're a Queens alum, you're never alone. We're always going to be here for you. Just, just give us a call. Yeah, that's great. Good reminder. Well, thanks very much. And uh, I guess all the best in 2022 to you, to our audience, to everybody. Same to you. Stay <laughs> safe, everyone. Yeah. Thanks again.